My apologies for not speaking German, but uh, by the time I leave here, I may be speaking German. Uh, I have no idea how long this is going to uh, take. This isn't really about me, it's about uh, an attempt to silence any movement to oppose the trade in shark fins. The trade in shark fins is actually the uh, third largest illegal trade after guns and drugs. And last year, Costa Rica shipped off 30 tons of shark fins to China. 30 tons. That's hundreds of thousands of sharks. And that brings in a lot of money. And that money buys a lot of influence. And when I met with the foreign minister for Costa Rica, it was rather funny because he said, don't worry, in Costa Rica, we, we have no corruption. It's not a corrupt country. <laughs> and then he said, you'll be perfectly safe in our jails because we have two ex-presidents and they're safe and they're in prison. <laughs> so I said, well, let's go back to where you said there's no corruption. What are the two ex-presidents doing in prison? <laughs> It's a very corrupt country. I have volunteered to go to Costa Rica if they lift the extradition. I said, all you have to do is set a trial date. We'll bring our witnesses, we'll bring our film, and we'll go to the trial. They don't want to do that. Why? They want me brought in handcuffs to be put in a prison for up to a year until they set that trial date. And for what? 10 years ago, we were working with the rangers at Cocos Island, off uh, 300 miles off of Costa Rica. And the year before, in 2001, we had intercepted an Ecuadorian longliner that was catching hundreds of sharks. We seized the vessel, we turned it over to the rangers, and that became the first vessel to ever be confiscated by the Costa Rican courts for illegal fishing. We set a precedent. In response to that, the rangers wanted us to work with them. So we were providing them with generators and boats, and we were their main source of supply for equipment. So the next year we were to come back and sign an agreement with the uh, Costa Rican government. And on our way down in April of 2002, we encountered a Costa Rican longliner in the waters of Guatemala that was killing sharks and finning them, and you saw that on the film. We filmed this, we told them to stop, they refused. So we got in touch with the Guatemalan government and the Guatemalan government gave us permission to stop them, which we did. Didn't think anything of it, we carried on to Costa Rica. And the next day we were boarded by the police and the prosecutors and I was charged with endangering the lives of the fishermen. Nobody was injured, no property was damaged. So we went into court and we showed them our film and our witnesses and they dropped the charges. So we were free to go. Two days later, we were boarded again a second time because they had appointed a new prosecutor and a new judge and charged me all over again. So we went into court, we showed them our film, we gave them our statements and witnesses and they dropped the charges. And I was given permission to leave Costa Rica. That was 10 years ago. Never heard a thing about it since then until I arrived in Frankfurt on May 13th to find that I was arrested because Costa Rica had an extradition warrant on me and it had been dismissed by Interpol as being politically motivated by every other country in Europe. So if I had landed in France or Spain or Italy or England, I would not have been arrested. Germany, which does not have an extradition treaty with Costa Rica decided to act on it, and no explanation has been given as to why they are doing that. The Justice Minister will say nothing. Shame on Germany. And, but I, I should point out, the people in Germany have been incredible, um, but we haven't had very much support from the politicians. Of course, that's probably pretty much the case everywhere in the world. Politicians don't do much anyway. Uh, when you want something done, you gotta get people to do it, and. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we get punished for doing that. But what has happened over the last 10 years that has gotten them so angry? We have a partnership in the Galapagos Islands with the Rangers and the Ecuadorian police. 
and over the last 10 years, we have seized numerous Costa Rican vessels, and we have confiscated over 200,000 shark fins uh, from these vessels. We have cost them millions of dollars. That's what's behind all of this, the fact that we are costing these people millions of dollars, and they buy influence, and those politicians want me back in Costa Rica. In 2002, the rangers at Cocos Island said that they had put a $25,000 hit on me, that is the shark binners, and that anybody can get $25,000 if they kill me. I don't know what it is now, but what better place to collect on that than in a Costa Rican jail? That's where they want me. They don't want a trial. They want an execution. And that's what this is all about. Over the last 10 years in the Galapagos, what we've done is we set up an AIS system, cost us a million euros to do it, that detects every single vessel that comes into the national park. We've supplied a p patrol boat, a canine unit, dogs that ship, sif, sniff out the shark fins, and radios for the police, and we've become a very important part of protecting the Galapagos. We want to do, we've been wanting to do this with Cocos Island also. What we've seen is an incredible diminishment. The shark population at Cocos Island is probably about 10% of what it was 20 years ago. And all over the world you're finding that this is the case. Fish populations, shark populations are collapsing. Every year we are killing 75 to 100 million sharks. And everybody says, oh well, you know, sharks are dangerous creatures, they're monsters. The average number of people killed by sharks every year is five. The average number of people killed by ostriches every year is 100. The ostrich is far more dangerous than the shark. And the number of people who are killed by lightning on golf courses every year is far greater. The number of people killed by coconuts dropping on their heads in Hawaii is far greater. <laughs> Sometimes people get killed when they go into places where things happen. But the shark is not that monster that everybody thinks it is. In fact, what the shark is, is the architect of our oceans. 450 million years of evolution has been molded by the shark. Every fish you see in the sea, its behavior, its color, its camouflage, is because of the shark. It is the apex predator and the ultimate architect of life in the sea. And if we remove it, we cause irreparable damage to our oceans. What Sea Shepherd is about is not just protecting whales and sharks and seals. It's about protecting the biodiversity of our oceans, the life support system of planet Earth. If the oceans die, we die. It's as simple as that. We don't live on this planet with a dead ocean. And right now, we are in the process of destroying life in our oceans, from plankton to the great whales. And you're not going to stop this by taking pictures and hanging banners and sending letters. You're only going to stop it by direct intervention. So I set the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society up 35 years ago, not to protest. I don't believe in protesting. To me, protesting is submissive. You know, please, please, please don't kill the whales. And they do it anyway. Nobody has killed a whale since we, when we show up because we tell them we're not here to protest, we're here to stop you. With whaling, for instance, in the Southern Ocean last year, the Japanese got 26% of their quota. The year before that, 17% of the quota. We've cost them hundreds of millions of dollars over the last eight years. That's why they're so angry. So last October, the Japanese government gave $30 million from the Tsunami Relief Fund to the whalers to use against Sea Shepherd. And what are they doing with that money? PR firms, lawyers, they, try, they, they tried an injunction on us in the United States, they failed, they lost the case. And they've been looking everywhere in the world to find ways to do it. The Prime Minister of, of Japan met with the President of Costa Rica in December. And that's the connection right there. Japan is really behind this, Japanese pressure. Now, good news, last yesterday, uh, our court case in England, we were being sued by the Maltese company Fish and Fish because in 2010, we released 800 bluefin tuna from their nets off of Libya. And they sued us. Yesterday, we won. They have to pay our legal costs, so they have to give us 200,000 pounds. <laughs>
And the amazing thing is, the amazing thing is, is for 35 years we've been doing this, we've never been sued successfully by anybody. We've won every case. We have never been convicted of a crime. We have never injured anybody, and we've never had anybody seriously injured. We're proud of that record, and we intend to keep it. If, go, if we go to Costa Rica and I go on trial, we will win this case because everything is on film. Everywhere we go, we bring cameras. The camera is the most powerful weapon that's ever been invented, and we don't do anything without cameras that are on there. That's the reason we started our own television show. If you want people to pay attention, get your own television show. <laughs> if it isn't on television, it's not real. <laughs> And how that happened is that I went to all the TV, TV networks and I said, you know, the biggest show on Discovery right now is a bunch of men going into a very rough area of the ocean and catching crabs. I can give you men and women from around the world going to a far more remote place, a far rougher seas to save whales and we'll throw in icebergs and penguins. It's got to be better than catching crabs. And so that show is now the number one show on, on Animal Planet and uh, that has been a very, very uh, good base of support for Sea Shepherd. Now the reason Sea Shepherd has been successful over the 35 years is because of one very important thing. Our crews are volunteers from all over the world. That's what makes Sea Shepherd what it is. The imagination, the courage, and the passion of those volunteers. And we've had over 4,000 people participate on our ships. And they come from everywhere. Because I could not pay people to do what these people do for nothing. The risks that they take and the work and the effort they put into it, you couldn't hire anybody to do this. And so that's what makes us unique is the men and women from around the world who crew on our ships and the men and women from around the world who support us on shore. This is what makes us what we are, an all-volunteer organization. Because I feel that to address impossible problems, we need impossible solutions. And I believe the impossible can become possible through the application of imagination, courage, and passion. An example I always show about that is 1972. The very idea that Nelson Mandela would be president of South Africa in 1972 was unthinkable, unimaginable, and impossible. Yet it happened. So I think we can save our oceans as impossible as it might seem. And that's going to come from the imagination, passion, and courage of hundreds of thousands of people around the world getting involved. Because people make a difference. People solve problems. Governments do not. When my daughter was uh, 12 years old, she came home from school with a note and uh, the teacher was upset with her because her, the question was, what is the definition of government? And my daughter said, oh, it's a bunch of men who get together to kill animals and other people. <laughs> and they were very, very upset about that. And I said, well, it's a pretty accurate definition as far as I can see. Because when you look back throughout history, every single social problem has not been solved by government. Slavery was ended by Douglas and Wilberforce. Women got the vote because of the suffragettes who were in the streets. You know, it was the Gandhis and the Mandalas and the, these are the, the, the people who made a difference, not presidents and prime ministers. And the reason that we have this pirate symbol as our, our flag well, first of all, people were calling us pirates, and we said, okay, if you want to be, call us pirates, we'll be pirates. Uh, they call us eco-terrorists, but that's wrong. I don't work for BP. <laughs> but if you go back to the 17th century, if you go back to the 17th century, when piracy was out of control in the Caribbean, it wasn't the British or the Spanish navies that shut down the pirates. The reason for that, people were making money. Merchants in London were making money. The Navy was taking bribes. The politicians were taking bribes. Not much different than the way things are today. Piracy was shut down by Henry Morgan, a pirate. You want to stop pirates, you get pirates to do it. Because the biggest pirates in the world are the presidents and the prime ministers and the congressmen and everybody, though the politicians, or as Mark Twain once referred to the United States Congress as the Parliament of Whores. <laughs> So this is who we're fighting, people who are guarding vested interests. Our oceans are in trouble. Our oceans are dying, and nobody is doing 
anything about it on a government level. We have all the laws, we have all the regulations, we have the treaties, but there's no economic or political willpower to uphold it. We just had this pathetic meeting in Rio de Janeiro, 20 years after the last pathetic meeting in Rio de Janeiro, where they all got together and stayed in five-star hotels and ate gourmet meals and signed a letter about how we promise we're going to make a difference. They never make a difference. That's where they coined the word sustainable back in 1992. You know what sustainable means? Business as usual under another name. We'll just call everything sustainable and we can sell it. That's all it's about. There is no sustainable fishery in the world today. Not one. The oceans are dying. And they're dying because of this thing what we call I call it the economics of extinction. There's money to be made by driving species extinct. And the bluefin tuna is a good example. One fish, one fish is worth 50,000 euros. One fish. With that kind of price on its head, its chances of survival are not very good. One fish. But as the numbers in the ocean go down, the price for the ones in the warehouses go up and Mitsubishi and other companies are putting them into warehouses. They got a 10 year supply. And if there's no more bluefin tuna in our oceans, and the only bluefin tuna left are in Mitsubishi's warehouses in Japan, a half a, half a million euro fish is what we're talking about, and billions of profits for Mitsubishi. They want the fish to go extinct because diminishment translates into higher prices. And this is happening all over the world. They don't care about the future. They just care about short-term investment for short-term gain. And now what they're doing is robbing all future generations. So what's the world going to look like in 100 years? You know what I find really amazing is when politicians say, oh, that's OK. Uh, the United Nations said that our fisheries will not collapse until 2048. <laughs> So that's uh, fine if you were just born last year and by the time you're 50 years old, there's no more fishing industry, but that's okay, that's your problem. It's not our problem. We're gonna eat our monkfish and our salmon and our cod and our bluefin tuna and fuck you. You know, that's pretty much what we're saying to future generations. And that's where we've got to, we've got to intervene because we represent the majority. All of those people who have yet to be born from here on in. We're representing them, and they need us to take a stand. So I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen if they send me back to Costa Rica. It really doesn't matter. Uh, what will be, will be. But we certainly intend to use this whole case as a way to focus on the big problem, the killing of our sharks and the destruction of our oceans. And we're gonna, I'm gonna do everything I can to uh, put the attention on that particular thing. Uh, if I go to Costa Rica, I go to Costa Rica. But I'll tell you one thing, if I do go to Costa Rica, and I do get killed in Costa Rica, the government of Germany will be responsible. And they, they should